Hey everybody, today is Monday, February 17th, 2020. My name is Matt Fury and you are listening to The Rough Cut. Well, hey there, Rough Cut friends and family. Well, I doubt anyone in my family is actually listening to this, but stranger things have happened. Uh, anyway, let me get you caught up on where we are if you missed last week. Now, last week's episode featured Rough Cut go-to guy Dan Leventhal talking about editing Bad Boys for Life with editor Peter McNulty. Speaking of Dan and tying back to our road trip to Sundance, festival season is still alive and well. Next up, South by Southwest. I will be there. In fact, I will be there with Dan hosting a panel on editing Marvel movies. Dan and I will be joined by editors Debbie Berman and Michael Shaver. Together, they edited Black Panther. Debbie was also an editor on Captain Marvel. We're going to be presenting that panel at 3.30 p.m. on Saturday, March 14th, so it should be a lot of fun. And if you're going to be at South By, make sure to come by and see us. In fact, I'll be doing another panel earlier that same day, uh, at 2 p.m. to be precise, on the psychology of sound design and film. Pretty heady stuff. That panel will feature acclaimed sound designers and re-recording mixers Ai Ling Lee, Will Files, and Craig Hennigan. And then on top of all that, on uh, Friday and Saturday morning, my hype man Burbank Mike Krulik will be doing demos of the new media composer at the Dell exhibit across the street from the convention center. So drop by, steal some of whatever free stuff that Dell is giving away, and come say hello. I would love to meet you. Seriously, if you're going to be at the festival that opening weekend, reach out to me on the contact page. Or just email me at matt at the roughcutpod.com and we'll try and meet up. Okay, on to today's podcast. Or should I call it yesterday's podcast? Let me explain. Uh, today's podcast features editor Paul Matchless talking about the film Baby Driver. But Baby Driver came out a couple of years ago. I know that. So why am I releasing it now? Well, there's a few reasons. One, Paul is a great interview and has a lot of good stuff to share. So that's a given. And two, it was never released previously to this. So the question becomes, why wasn't it released? Well, here's the story. Paul and some people from Sony reached out to me as they were getting close to finishing production on Baby Driver, and they let me know that Paul had a really interesting workflow for the film, and they wanted to talk about it a bit. They told me he was editing on set, which I thought, well, you know, big deal, that happens a lot, but I wasn't about to pass up a chance to actually go down to Atlanta where they were shooting the movie and interview Paul. And that's exactly what I did. Paul and his avid were inside a makeshift soundstage where they were filming a sort of dance number. It was this highly choreographed sequence where the main character, Baby, is running around his apartment stashing money he earned as a getaway car driver. Really fun stuff, and when you listen to this interview, if I can ever shut up and get to it, you'll actually hear them shooting all this stuff to playback. Now, it turns out what was actually unique about Paul's workflow was two things. First, they were shooting 35mm film, but he was employing a kind of digital workflow where he was capturing from a video tap as well as the sound recorder right into his Avid. And he was using a product called q -Tick. You should check it out. It's really neat. But the other part of the whole workflow that was so interesting is that as he was capturing this footage, he was dropping it into a timeline that already had a pre-edit of basically the whole film. The movie is so largely driven, pardon the pun, uh, by music that he and Edgar Wright were able to put together a rough cut, and there's another pun, uh, using just music, sound effects, and the audio from the table reads they did with the actors. So they really had the whole movie done and, and they were able to pitch it to the studios before they even shot a single frame of film. And Paul will go into much greater detail with all this in the interview, but I thought it would help to if I set the table, so to speak. I don't think I ever actually answered the question about why I waited until now to release this. Uh, what happened was that after I recorded this interview, we ended up doing a bunch of on-camera and stage presentations with Paul. So it felt like we had already had enough out there with Paul and that this would have been a little redundant. But to be honest, in those other presentations, we didn't really get into the depth we did here. Plus, this is actually recorded on set, which is really cool, albeit very tough to edit and mix with all that noise going on which is the final reason that it took so long to release this. But regardless of the reason, the time is now. So here he is, live on location of the film Baby Driver, editor Paul Matchless. So Paul, this is your third uh, feature film with director Edgar Wright. How is this one different and or similar from the other projects like World's End or Scott Pilgrim? Well, I think this is a... Um probably a, a culmination really of the way Edgar and I have been working sort of since Pilgrim but probably in its sort of biggest form in terms of editing on set really which started off as a, a very tiny thing for a couple of pickups on Pilgrim grew to helping him out on set for the action sequences on World's End to now being probably on set maybe 90% of the time for the entire film. 
One major reason being is that there, this film has a mix of sort of music and dialogue and action, all of which are actually very dependent on each other. And you need all three elements to be working for the scene to be, I think, what it is in sort of Edgar's mind. And so we sort of early on thought, well, the best way for that is to actually have me effectively on set, plugged into the cameras, so to speak, and literally putting shots, putting scenes together as they're shooting. So how is it that you are plugged into the cameras? What's the technical aspect of how that all works? You know, you talk about being involved in the, the, the action immediately. As he's doing a take, you know whether or not he's got what he needs. Yes, well, it's very, you know, you would think, and there are very elegant solutions in this day and age for doing that. Say, for example, if we were shooting on an Arri Alexa, we'd have a, a, a DIT. A DIT would be able to make Avid-compatible files. He could just spit them right out. I'd be able to input them, and these would be files with metadata which could carry straight through to the final edit but for aesthetic reasons and reasons i actually completely agree with uh we're shooting this on 35 mil so we're sort of doing a mix of i guess 20 21st and 20th century technologies and what's basically happening in this instance is the cameras uh, are fitted with HD video taps, which then gets recorded by the video assist, and he's using a uh, Q-take. Um, he's recording them as ProRes files. I am then connected via Ethernet from my Avid system to his Mac Pro, so I have access to the folder where all his media files are generated. And so basically, as soon as they all cut, and Jeff, the video assist chap, stops recording, I can see on my Finder window that that file becomes immediately available for me to use. And then I use the AMA linking system to immediately grab that file. So without any need to sort of import or transcode, I can literally just grab the file. Uh, so within seconds, if Edgar sort of goes, does that look good, Paul? Have we got it? You know, I can drop it into the timeline immediately and, you know, give him a response quite literally within, within seconds. So when you say drop it into the timeline, as you said, you have your media composer here on a little rolling cart, which is looks very nice. How are you able to tell within what context are you are you judging whether or not this thing is, is going to work or not? Uh, well, because in terms of if there's elements sitting with music as well, I will already have uh, stuff on my timeline which are either from animatics that he and I have worked on in the past, or I've taken bits from the main uh, Avid system from the cutting rooms and brought them down here. Um, and because, you know, having helped uh, out in, in the prep area, you sort of know, like by certain points, certain action needs to occur by a certain musical beat or a downbeat or by a certain bar, you know you have to get to that point. And I think one thing we're trying to do on this film is not, uh, as it were, fix it all in post. I think we're trying to keep everything running, you know, with real time, that this all actually sort of happened and that editing is there to help, you know, join everything together. But the flow is natural. You know, we don't want to be sitting there doing too much sort of frame cutting and things like that. I mean, sometimes that's sort of inevitable that you have to, but on the whole, we're trying to sort of keep it in camera as much as we can. Uh, and that's where this system allows me to give an immediate kind of feedback because I can see, especially because, you know, when you shoot, you shoot out of order. So there's a point where you've got the shot before and the shot after. You really need to make sure the shot in between starts at the right place and ends at the right place, but in the right time. Now, as it happens, we're actually shooting a highly choreographed scene on set right now. And you had mentioned that Obviously, there's, there's a playback on set, so the actor knows how to choreograph his moves to that playback. You had mentioned that the audio that we're hearing actually was something that you had done sound design on or your team had done sound design on as much as, as I think, five years ago. Yes, yes. We have done some very talented people who Wega likes working with, and um, it's been a combination of they've been given tracks, and in conjunction with Edgar, they've come back with basically effectively a complete multi-layered mix uh, with sort of spot effects, occasional dialogue, um, uh, uh, atmospheres, and they all blend into a stereo stereo track. Other times there have been animatics that Edgar has worked on either with myself or with other editors where 
you know, effects have been put in. So we, we like we know certain action has to occur at a certain point. So one good thing is actually I tend to sometimes just work with, especially if there's a scene with, that requires no dialogue, I tend to use that as playback already on the timeline. So I can see how their on-screen action will match with the effects, you know, that more or less line up. I mean, obviously, we will go back and recreate all that properly with, you know, better sound quality and, you know, the sound team will go to town on it. But basically, it knows that it's kind of a a vindication that an idea that Edgar may have thought of three or four years ago uh, is now working as well as the probably image that he'd had in his mind all that time ago. So speaking of ideas and their origination... What kind of discussions did you have with Edgar early on about this film, which has been in percolating for quite a long time, when he approached you and said, I've got this idea and I want to base it around... Well, let me let you tell it. Yeah, well, I think he'd had the script for some time and he'd always knew it was going to be sort of music, music-based. And I think it was sometime around October, November of 2011 that he first said, hey, could you help me sort of sequence these and maybe just hear what they sound like if you overlap overlap the tracks and just see what the almost like a dj mix effectively i think was the first thing and just so then he could hear the tracks all sort of play in one into the other uh no dialogue initially just the tracks uh and then we slowly embellish those and he would sort of say right at that point we need the sound effect of a car horn here or this that there so then we have trap music with spot effects sort of thrown in uh so then he could start to hear maybe in his mind you know, further uh, embellishments of the sound. I think then in 2012, he arranged a table read uh, in Los Angeles that he sent me the file of. Um, and then we took it the next step where we basically had all the dialogue from the film of, the, of, of that version of the script with the music that we'd already put together, but we could now space out with the dialogue and then put the sound effects together much um, more sort of succinctly and in you know, in tandem with words and, and, and music. And at the end of that, and that took a couple of months, I think, but at the end of that, we had sort of about a 100-minute timeline, audio only, but of the entire film. So you could play to an exec, they could put the headphones on, and they could literally hear the entire film from start to finish, from the opening music track to the track that Edgar's chosen for the end roller. It was just all there. So together with Edgar, um, you two have really sort of defined your own aesthetic when people watch your films, they know, oh, this is this is Paul's work. I, you know, it has a very kinetic, very in-your-face style. That's you know, Edgar's talked a lot about it in other interviews about um, it being economical and just really just something a tool to drive the story as opposed to just sort of laying back and let the story happen. How did that evolve? Do you feel like that's that's changed quite a bit from World's End to Pilgrim to now? Or do you think that you guys had a very clear understanding of that kind of kinetic editing that you wanted to do? Well, I think Edgar... Um, has always been very keen on obviously establishing his style um, which you know you, you you could see it as far back as sort of spaced really and you know it's uh, you know that style gets refined and improved over the years and then I guess in terms of in terms of the editing I mean certainly the way he films you know helps sort of dictate a method of of editing because sometimes you know he does setups that you know you only feel can sort of only go one way but that's sort of his idea having said that there is a lot of leeway nowadays as well because he does still a lot of coverage and you know a lot of options you can still sort of take what he does and add your own little elements to it just in terms of you know uh sometimes where you think the edit could go may not necessarily initially feel where he might think it could go but I mean that's the beauty of it sometimes you can present a new perspective to it which he may have initially thought and you go yeah that's good let's 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 keep keep that in um and that's how it works I mean that's you know he he's very much a person who knows what he wants but at the same time uh he's open to uh to to ideas and you know maybe sometimes looking at things a little differently than maybe even he'd first envisioned but then that's the beauty of the craft of editing really it it just allows you to explore a lot of options and thankfully he does give you a lot of options to explore with so speaking of the craft of editing i think one of the things that gets lost in this kind of high energy style of, of cutting that you guys do is that it's really not it doesn't rely on any sort of visual effects wizardry even though a film like scott pilgrim might involve a lot of really cool graphics and effects things like that the real magic of the editing is in just 
cuts and and whips and yeah. just just the visual elements. You don't, you don't really need anything all that complex to do what you're doing, but you have to do it just right. Yeah, I mean it's it really is a case of less is more. You know, if you can tell the story in just cuts, you can. The Cohen brothers work. You know, you 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 sort of think that you know every every edit has a meaning to it. There's a purpose for for, for every cut and. Um, I remember thinking along similar lines, saying, yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, Edgar, I think Edgar thinks that as well. Um, I know, I'm, I, mean, I think I'm right in saying, I think Raising Arizona is one of his very favorite films. Um, uh, but yes, I mean, he designs things that, you know, a, well, a well-placed cut can be uh, just as funny as a well-timed line of dialogue. And I think that's what you aim for. You aim for... Uh, you know, it's that old cliche of when an editor does their best work, nobody notices because, you know, they're so involved with the story. So if you're doing your job right, it's the art of what you do that basically allows the, the, the flow that the audience doesn't have to sort of think about, unless you're doing something, you know, a deliberate smash cut or something, which, you know, you, 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 you want to jolt the audience out of it. Um, the flow just becomes completely natural, yet it's still totally imbued with Edgar's visual approach to it. So to edit with this kind of precision that you do, it seems like it really requires a lot of discipline and certainly a lot of organization. I think you know editing in general demands to be really organized. How do you organize your projects? Do you have a general method for how you approach a film or and has any of that changed specific to this film, Baby Driver? You know, over the years, you, um, you, know, you sort of develop your, your style and then you sort of stick to it just sort of, uh, you know, because you can approach with Abbott, you can approach it in so many different ways. I think you find something that you're comfortable with. And certainly, you know, when you're working with a first and second AD, you sort of go, I like having this folder here. You know, you have, you know, I have a scenes that I've edited, scenes that I haven't edited. If there's a scene that I have edited, uh, and yet new footage has come in the meantime, I will find that popped in back to the scenes to edit again with a little sort of, you know, a letter after it, an X or something, which tells me, yes, you've cut this scene, but in the meantime, the unit of shot something else for or it was incomplete so there they did a pickup so there's a little language that you sort of you know discover and also you know my method of um i tend to line all takes up on uh the timeline so i have a very very long timeline depending on the amount of footage shot for that particular scene i line them all up so i can watch them all and then i create a gap at the top of the timeline i start uh, start doing the edit but then what i do is that i tend to use dupe detection not so much as a flash frames or double frames i think but i can actually then look at all the clips further down the timeline and i can just get a picture of sometimes how many uh how much i've taken of one particular take or how much i've used that setup for uh and then i find it useful because then i use reverse match frame to then go to that point on that uh, further down the timeline so um i know a lot of people you know, they, they fill the bins with metadata or they like to sort of view thumbnails and things like that. Um, and I really don't do that. I, I tend to sort of lay it all down on the timeline and just by watching the takes over and over and watching the different angles and the different setups, then you get to learn the director's intent um, um, and, you know, you get a sort of an idea of how you can start putting it together. So oftentimes on a project, an editor is asked to do so much more than edit. And I think you illuminated that a little bit with describing uh, the work you did with Edgar up front in pre-production. But also, you know, here on set, uh, on location, you're doing more than just editing. You're also doing some sort of second unit work as well. How did that come about? Uh, well, that's something we started on, on, on World's End. He asked me, does it help out to oversee second unit work? Uh, I mean, it's nothing sort of more exciting as, you know, sort of inserts or cutaways or up and passes and things but you know they're just as they're just as vital um and i think it you know you get to a point where you know the director sort of says well why don't you go off and do it because you know exactly what's required you know what side of the line you need to be shooting it on you sort of written over roughly the size of the shot and more importantly you know what i'm after as you know as edgar would say so you know, then the extra responsibility then means, once again, not even being in front of an avid at all, but just sort of being on set, sort of overseeing, you know, little shots, which are, which may be, you know, tiny moments, but all go towards the big picture. And, you know, and they're, they're, Edgar, they're completely Edgar's ideas of, you know, because he has a lot of detail in his scenes. Um, so it's, it's always good to make sure those little moments 
get covered uh, correctly. Because your your style and the aesthetic you created with Edgar has such a unique signature to it, do you ever worry about being too much, too much of yourselves? Do you ever do you ever look at this and go, oh, this is this is too much of what we do or what we're known for? We need to back off here. Do you do you worry about being um, stealing from yourself? I guess. Um, well, I mean, if, if you sort of say, well, do you do you fall into sort of cliched patterns? Um, I don't know. I think, you know, I'm always interested to see sort of, you know, every time we do a new project, what Edgar's approach will be this time around. But I think every time you see it, there is a, there is a change, you know. I don't think it's like a, it's like a franchise that basically, you know, you tune in knowing what you're going to get every single time. Oh, yes, the, that old thing, that old thing. I mean, there are some stock in trade things, you know, Edgar's very fond of, you know, the wipes and the whips and things like that but you know that's that's a language that's his sort of punctuation really and no reason why he should change that but at the same time i've never really felt like every film is just more of the same um with edgar and i'm always interested to sort of see uh you know like i say what he brings to the table and go all oh, right he's trying something different here you know there's like whole scenes which don't have to be edited at a million miles an hour you know and sometimes you know less is more and you go okay and you know you think that's great so he's he he changes um and then basically you change because you respond to his material so actually you find that um you find that really interesting because then you're you're just aware of the development um uh and that works yeah in editorial as much as it does uh, probably from his approach to it so obviously you've created a very elaborate setup here so that you're able to be part of the production while editing but all that's for naught if you can't take the work you've done here back into let's just call it primary editorial or back in the room so how does that process works that the audio and the video tap stuff that gets captured here put into your avid how does that live on later on down in post-production uh well of course we did have to uh uh think of a, th uh, a system i mean thankfully uh one reason why this works as smoothly as it does is because we're using an hd video tap on on the world's end uh, the budget would only switch to standard deaf video taps, so it meant that the picture coming back was PAL. However, of course, you know, PAL is 25, but film is shooting in 24, uh, so I had to have a PAL project, and what we did is actually, we actually, on, in that instance, we sent longitudinal audio time code onto track two of the, of the clip, so I'd obviously have to keep uh, having that off the mixer, otherwise I'd be blasted with a a loud burst of time code, but what it meant was that was the 24 frame time code sitting on track two, um, and that meant that uh, in editorial then they could use the auxiliary reader in the Avid to translate that time code, and then they'd have a, a pretty good chance of then matching the, matching the shot. Here now, of course, because we're HD and HD is 24 along with the film, um, we have no such problems, uh, but of course it's still film, and we're not having any disgenerated time code files or anything like that so what we're doing this time is that the sound department are sending the master audio time code uh which is being generated from them to video assist who then take that as an external input which drives the time code on the cue take so it means when i get a file a quick time file the timestamp is um uh that of the time code on the cue take which of course is the time code being sent from audio um and then of course avid will you know use the timestamp as the basis for uh, the time code for the clip so it means that jerry my first assistant will then get the original footage he can see the slate and take number because that information carries on on the time carries through on the timeline so he's not guessing what the shots are um, but then he can see the time code of the onset edit clip, and that will of course match with the time code of the sunk audio uh, and video clips in the Avid. Uh, I mean, it does get a little bit more interesting if you're doing video only. You know, it's not foolproof because if they're not rolling, rolling sound, uh, they're not necessarily sending time code, and sometimes you'll shoot with a unit that's just MOS, so you'll have no time code. So then it becomes a little bit more, you know, fun for the first assistant to try and work out what the hell you've done. They still see the slate and the take numbers, but very occasionally then it has to come down to good old eye matching. 
uh, in the worst case scenario. But that's only representative of a small amount of stuff we're doing for this, for this show. So you started working with Edgar, you met Edgar on a sitcom, British sitcom called Spaced. And one of the things that really set that show apart was how cinematic it was, even for a 23-minute, 24-minute UK sitcom. How do you think that prepared uh, you guys for what you're doing today? You know, it's always that, it's always that thing of, uh, you know, I'm going to throw everything at it because I'll probably never be allowed to make anything ever again. Everyone will just think it's too wacky. So I will put all my ideas and just chuck them at the wall and, and see, see how it works. And that's sort of effectively what space was about. But I mean, space was very, very good storytelling as well as fantastic acting and course direction. Um, you know, because all the, rec- the recognizable style was sort of already there. And yeah, it's just something you learn. And I think, you know, being, being my first project with Edgar, you know, you learn very quickly what a director wants, what they're after. And I, and I realized very quickly that, you know, you're, that Edgar is, is, his approach is a little different to, to that of, um, other directors, uh, but none the worse for it because you get, you know, unique, unique programs, unique films, basically. So, you know, over the years, it's probably been a refinement and an improvement of that technique. Probably, you know, for him and certainly editorially uh, for me, you know. But, you know, you, there's always things you, you know, you, I think you learn, you know, you really learn about what's, what's important as well, like as well as a good action sequence. You want to make sure that you never lose hold of the story because it's all about it's all about the story otherwise obviously it can approach some visual effects demo reel if you're not careful but edgar always has a good story to tell earlier on today we were talking about um how influential a lot of these films are to up-and-coming filmmakers and how they're sort of adopting that style what advice would you have for a lot of these kids that are starting out today whether or not they want to get into the field of editing or just filmmaking in general. Um, I mean, the thing I would say is, firstly, you know, watch a lot of stuff, watch a lot of movies, and just, you know, sometimes disassociate yourself with the actual act of watching a movie and, and maybe look a little bit more at how it's constructed, sort of how it's put together. Um, and I think if you're looking at editing, I mean, it's always good. It's like... It's like um, it's like learning, I think it's like learning the keyboard as well, and especially if you're a composer, because what you do is you learn other people's pieces, and then that gives you, you know, hopefully, eventually the tools to start doing that yourself. And sometimes it can be a little bit like, well, why don't you try editing something like you saw on that Martin Scorsese film, or all the way, you know, Spielberg edits, because, you know, his, him and Michael Kahn's, uh, you know, their, his editing... Uh, it's actually particularly, you know, remarkable when you line it up against Steven Spielberg's directing. Um, but I think, you know, my advice would be try and emulate sort of a style or a technique that you sort of admire because it's always a good basis to then go off and try your own thing and develop, develop your own style from that. And I think that's how I, that's how I did it. You know, I, I sort of copied style so I think well, I could edit like that. But then how would I do it differently? And then over the years, your own your own method and technique will come out. Well, there you go. Paul Matchless, live on the set of the film Baby Driver. I'd like to retroactively thank Paul for his time and for inviting me down to Atlanta to see all that. I'm a big fan of the work that Paul and Edgar Wright do. Baby Driver was great. Paul was actually nominated for an Oscar for it, if you didn't know that. And of course, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World is one of my favorites. As I mentioned, Paul and Edgar are working right now on a film called Last Night in Soho. And if it's anything like their previous efforts, I can't wait to see it. It is due out near the end of this year. But you know what you don't have to wait for? Getting the same Avid Media Composer system that Paul uses. Well, not the exact same one. That would really slow things down on Edgar's new film. But you can get one just like it through the miracle of the internet and a hopefully valid credit card. Just click the link to the Avid store in the show notes and you will be on your way. I need to be on my way as well. On my way to making another podcast. So come back again next week and see who it is. I wouldn't mind knowing myself. But until that mystery is revealed, this is your pal Matt Fury thanking you once again for joining me right here on The Rough Guide.